Hello, everyone. I'm Ron Westfall of the Futurum Group, and you're joining us here today at the Marvell Industry Analyst Event. And I'm very pleased to have a distinguished guest with us today, Sundeep Barthi. And to start things off, first of all, Sundeep, please share who you are and what you do in terms of uh, at the Marvell. Yeah, thank you, Ron. It's great to be here and uh, to share with you about what uh, exciting things we are doing at Marvell. I'm the Chief Development Officer here at Marvell. I joined uh, Mar uh, Marvell in February of 2019, so it's going to be soon five years. Mm -hmm. And um, I lead the development and central engineering activities. And uh, what that really means is really um, developing all the foundational technologies that our business units and the products use. And um, that's very pivotal for all the target end markets that we address. Excellent. Thank you, Sandy, for that intro. And so, hey, let's dive right in. The hot topic of the year is AI and the impact that it's having on the semiconductor industry as well as portfolio development. And from your perspective, what is it about AI that's driving portfolio innovation? What's you know, making all of the difference here in our ecosystem? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, I think um, AI really, a lot of people um, talk about training, inference, these large language models, and um, many of the technical jargon that we have uh, known since ChatGPT came online. Right. But really the technology depends upon all the compute infrastructure. Yes. Um, and when we say the compute infrastructure, people focus more on the compute, but there's also the data that gets generated and the data has to move from one place to the other, whether it is within the chip or between chip to chip or even off chip and board. Uh, and that's the data movement challenge. And the more the data gets generated, the more the data moves. And AI is all about um, you know, bringing data from one place to other securely computing it and storing it, and which is our mission statement, right? Yeah, so uh, no matter whether it's AI today, uh, yesterday, or in the future, these challenges will still remain, and that's what we are uh, intent on solving. Yes, yeah, so it's a very exciting times. And I think one thing that people are very interested in hearing about is, for example, AI's impact on Moore's Law. And uh, first of all, can you explain what is Moore's Law? And from your view, what is going to be different about Moore's Law as AI unfolds? Yeah, great question. I, I think um, Moore's Law, as, as you know, is not a physical law. It was an observation by Dr. Gordon Moore uh, in the 60s when he published. Uh, and he saw the trend that um, computing power uh, doubles at the rate of uh, 18 months to two years. And over the period of the last four or five decades, that has uh, been sort of right. And now as we move to the limits of semiconductor scaling, which means you know every process geometry uh, by classical scaling meant that if you were, say, let's go back to 28 nanometer, going to 20 or 16 nanometer, um, you could pack in two times the number of transistors in a given square millimeter or uh, a, a die. Uh, but as we have uh, you know, gone to five nanometer, three nanometer, and two nanometer in advanced CMOS, it's um, slowing down. Uh, it's mm -hmm. still there. People go to advanced technologies for three reasons. One is to pack more transistors in a given piece of silicon. Right. The other one is higher performance for the silicon uh, that you uh, pack in, and the third is energy efficiency or the lower power. Those are the three reasons. But because the limits of physics are almost being reached, there are newer innovations for transistors. So we had planar transistors that went to FinFET. Now there are you know, what they call the gate all around transistors or nanosheets, and it will soon be some other material. But you also have to integrate a number of these silicon um, uh, chips into uh, 3D stacking uh, to advance the scaling in a way or to keep the Moore's Law alive, uh, as well as uh, packaging strategies of 2.5D, 3D stacking, 
with um, chip on wafer on substrate activities or uh, those are aspects that is what AI also is um, you know bringing it up to how much more can we pack and how much right. more can we get in and out of the package yes no I, I agree I think packaging is going to be a huge differentiator for how silicon is selected and I think that is an excellent historical overview of Moore's law and what is going on today. Forward-looking Moore, what is Marvell doing to, first of all, take advantage of these capabilities and also specifically in relation to IP networking capabilities? Yeah, a very good uh, point to segue into is, you know, I want to move from what we talk about compute in AI to really the data movement, right? Yeah. Um, so advanced technologies allow us to actually give the power efficiency, low energy for data movement. But what is also happening is the analog mixed signal characteristics mm -hmm. uh, or the scaling, for example, the caches of uh, the SRAM or um, the CERDES or the serializer, deserializer architectures, they're not scaling as effectively as digital circuits. So what we need to do is really increase the bandwidth um, through different signaling um, mechanisms. One way I will, you know, just to explain is if you have a 10 lane highway, uh, you know, you can only send so many cars at a time with so sure. many passengers. But one way to double the number of passengers is, for example, go from two-seater passenger car to an SUV which seats six, or a double-decker bus which would probably seat 50 passengers. Likewise, we figure out how to send the bits and bytes by using the technology to cram in more transistors, but also um, evolve innovations in signaling transitions so we can send more bits uh, or a gigabits per second. That's another metric that we use in order to um, widen the bandwidth capability with also the uh, you know highest energy efficiency or low power yeah. and, and 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 that is done by a lot of innovations in analog mixed signal circuitry as well as you need um, different algorithms for error correction because when they go a certain distance just like um, they lose the fidelity and we need to build in uh, you know, through DSP algorithms, and that's what is very evident with our optical DSPs and, and coherent DSPs, which are various different signaling, which is PAM4 in optical, right. and uh, you know, uh, QPSK and QAM signaling in, in our coherent. So that's, that's how we take advantage of not only the advances in semiconductors, but also innovations in signaling techniques, innovations in, in, in um, our analog mixed signal portfolio. Yeah, I can understand that. And I think that does lay the foundation for you know, drilling down more on uh, a specific aspect of the portfolio that I see increasingly becoming important. And that is uh, the connectivity IP uh, capabilities. Uh, naturally, I know folks out there are very keen to know more about you know, what Marvell's doing in that area specifically. And also you know, any insight as to you know, the direction that you're seeing uh, these capabilities going. Yeah, um, uh, so let me uh, step back a bit on you know, the connectivity IP portfolio that we build. Um, right. I talked to you about um, you know, the one important figure of merit that we all care about is um, the gigabits per uh, second per right. millimeter, per millimeter of how much uh, uh, you, know, you need to travel within the chip or across the chip. And uh, the energy efficiency metric is called picojoules per bit, how much energy that you expend by transferring a bit, right? So if we go back, there was the classic NRZ or non-return to zero where you know, your signaling is zero and one. Then we went to PAM4 and you know, PAM4 is basically you use four levels to transfer bits. Uh, uh, and um, with coherent, it's really 16 uh, different levels. And um, so PAM4 went from 56 to 112, and now we are at 224. And uh, what, what is very critical in all these is how effectively your modulation schemes are used in, in, in really the, uh, you know, the signaling baud rate, 
or the you know the uh, the bandwidth and how much uh, correction that we can uh, uh, overlay on top of the signal loss that is there when you traverse uh, across chips. Uh, innovations are happening on a regular basis. Uh, so we were the uh, you know PAM4 signaling with our InFi acquisition with 112 gig. Then we are now at 224 gig. We recently announced the very first 1.6 tera uh, optical DSP called Nova. And uh, mm -hmm. on the coherent side, uh, we introduced Orion, which is our first 800 gig uh, coherent uh, DSP. And all this is proof uh, in, right. in what we are able to do. And it's not showing any signs of slowdown because the need for AI means right. more compute, more bandwidth, and, uh, um, yeah, and, and innovations will continue. I'm confident that we are uh, you know, approaching this in a manner, first principles, and uh, crazy enough to try it. Oh, sure. No, I, I think it's uh, just that. We're seeing the innovation engine moving forward. It's built in. And so that makes for a, a, a great foundation for more innovation. And so, yeah, this could be an opportunity to drill down on uh, some of the applications uh, that are benefiting from this. That includes, for example, uh, data center interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. And what else are you seeing in terms of the application side that's really benefiting from uh, these breakthroughs? Yeah, let me uh, draw your attention to what you're holding in your hand. <laughs> and uh, Product it, it, placement, perfect. <laughs> yes, this um, uh, what you're uh, uh, seeing is really our uh, very first uh, 51 tera switch. And you can look at that size of the package. The die is um, has 512 lanes of 112 gig SERDIs, which is right. packed all in that piece of silicon. And and we were talking about this earlier in, in in our conversation, that packaging and thermal and power management is is such an important vital piece. Yes. Uh, it's not always the bits and bytes. It's not always you know. We'll go from seven nanometer to five nanometer to whatever is the next uh, uh, process technology of choice. Uh, it is really a holistic design process of chip package interaction, package thermal mm -hmm. interaction, thermal and power management, and how all this is brought together in uh, you know innovative substrates um, and uh, connectors uh, right. and w what we call you know thermal interface materials to manage the thermal performance between where the dye is and the organic package is. So all this is really, there's innovations on just every vector that right. makes that, uh, uh, that dye and, and that entire package. So uh, with these hyperscalers and data centers, the challenges are, you know, you have a pizza box or you have a module, optical module, everything has a power envelope. And you don't have a product, or we don't have a product, if we don't meet those uh, uh, the specifications. And that's where the innovations are just not on the connectivity or IP portfolio, just not the process technology. It's just the entire platform. So that becomes very imperative as we are uh, addressing products for the hyperscalers. Yeah, I am certainly impressed by this packaging. You can grip it in the palm of your hand. And so what's not to like? And I think uh, that definitely uh, sets us up, uh, Sandy, for the uh, next um, topic that people are very interested in, and that is what Marvell is investing in. You know, can you uh, provide us some not only portfolio development uh, direction, but also you know a teaser on what's uh, going to happen in terms of, for example, marketing initiatives in, in that area. Yeah, so I, I think the investment is in several different areas. Uh, mm -hmm. For example. Uh, you know, standards are becoming an important piece, so you can't oh, yes. go at, at it alone. So we, we are uh, in several consortiums. That takes investment. That needs to know where the puck is headed. Uh, that's one area of investment. The other area is, for example, what are the, uh, you know, from a, uh, a foundry technology perspective, what right. other things are out there? For, you know, TSMC and, and the rest of the foundries are looking at various ways to get power, meaning right. uh, there's talk about backside power, uh, uh, right? And how does it uh, help the uh, integrity of, uh, so we are looking at these advanced things that are three, five years out. Now, we have heard of 224. 
the next frontier is 448, right? And what does 448 mean in terms of signaling standards, um, uh, modulation schemes? Um, and uh, then it's also EDA uh, uh, tools. Uh, for example, what AI techniques we should use in order for our chips to be better, faster, cheaper, uh, lower power. So um, it, it w what worked yesterday, it's the famous Einstein score, or um, maybe attributed to Einstein, is you can't solve tomorrow's problems with yesterday's solutions. Okay. So we have to be continuous in how do we build the chips? Are we doing it right? Do we need to build models such that mm -hmm. um, we help our design team, a very capable design team, uh, to take AI algorithms into account, uh, such that there is less bugs, where, because a bug is very expensive when found after the fact, uh, be, yeah. right? And if you're not first time to, first to market, you know you, you basically lost uh, the plot. So um, AI will change how we are going to build the chips too. So there is investment in terms of what techniques that we need to use in our development uh, process. Uh, so. Again, there is different vectors of investment in advanced technologies to build silicon software. How do we integrate all these things together and work with the ecosystem partners? Because we're not right. going at it alone. We have a hybrid strategy. We will develop stuff that, are, that we are good at, but we are also depending upon the ecosystem to get other uh, aspects that our hyperscalers and our customers need. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, that was my next question that you addressed it uh, superbly, and that is, you know, what about the partnerships? Earlier today, we talked about NVIDIA, ARM, and F5 came up. In terms of uh, partnerships, uh, what do you see Marvell doing in terms of you know, strengthening that aspect of the Marvell proposition? Yeah, so um, in, in our analyst day, you heard from many of my colleagues uh, talk about our flexible business model for right. building uh, you know, customized silicon, right? In there, in the, our partnerships are with our customers and with our vendors, including uh, the OSATs, uh, because there are many different kinds of uh, uh, products that we will build, right. right? Sometimes, for example, let's take a look at chiplets, right? If you need to integrate chiplets, that requires a different business model. It could be our own, it could be something from a third party, and thereby the ecosystem partnerships uh, come into play. Um, uh, both in terms of our foundry partners, our customers, end customers who will have to get you know HPM chiplets from somebody else, um, and EDA IP uh, providers. Uh, sometimes the ecosystem will mean that we may have to do modeling a little bit differently. So right. all so th that's how we are proceeding. We take each engagement as an engagement that is very customized. I, I see that as you know, part of the strategic vision and basically uh, bringing it together in terms of you know, Marvell's uh, process uh, capabilities, IP connectivity, and naturally uh, packaging uh, proposition. How is Marvell going to continue driving innovation across the ecosystem, quite simply make a difference with the partners and the customers out there? Yeah, so um, you know, uh, we have heard you have heard about what we are doing with silicon photonics. Uh, yes. uh, uh, these are long lead time items that mm -hmm. we continuously um, put out test vehicles. Sometimes these are uh, we learn from them, right, to further the um, uh, technology portfolio. These are you know s between one to three years, three to mm -hmm. five years. We have to experiment because uh, um, sometimes it may not be successful, and sometimes you learn with the mistakes that uh, we have, we do, and thereby get stronger at what works and what doesn't work. Um, so th th these are the various aspects by which we are um, uh, looking at future technologies. Some we can talk about, and some we can. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you. And with that, thank you everyone for joining the Future in Tech webcast. Please be sure to join our website to be able to see our latest installment. And with that, have a good semiconductor day, everyone. <laughs>